I just want to let you guys know briefly, this is our Huliko Akaya Ulu series. We have been doing this since 2014. We've had over almost 50 speakers come uh, throughout the last couple of years. We had almost 1,400 people sitting in the chairs that you guys are sitting in. Well, actually, not these exact chairs, because we started this when we were over at our old site at the, um, where Kavaihona is. Um, so we were um, able and blessed to um, have this site, our Kauhale, built. We've been here, this is our third school year um, for the preschool. We have 12 classrooms in the building next door, and we also have an infant toddler center. Um, this Kauhale building is some place where we do things exactly like what we're doing tonight. Bring the community together, talk story, fellowship with each other, learn about our culture, our community, learn about each other. Learn about what we can do to better our future generation. That's why we're here. And so I mahalo all of you for um, making the time to choosing to um, and choosing to be with us tonight. Um, you could have stayed home, watched TV, must, I don't know, something on TV, or it could have been someplace else, but you guys came over here. So again, I hope the food was ono, and I hope you guys have a good time. Um, the two groups that are sponsoring tonight's event, and we usually do, it's um, In Peace and Kamehameha Schools. There's a whole bunch of our staff here tonight. We all kokua. Uh, we do this once a month. Um, if any of you are interested in being a presenter or speaker, um, please just let us know. We're always looking for people who have mana'o to share about what they've been studying or what they've been um, able to achieve academically or culturally in the community. Come and share. This is the vehicle that we use to get the word out about what people are studying about us and great achievements in our community. So if you guys know of anybody or if you yourself would like to share, please come and talk story with us. Uh, let's see. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Um, oh, uh, we do have child care tonight. Auntie Carol is providing child care over in the, fo the food room. Um, so if you want to, when we're pow eat, I don't see too many of the little ones, <coughs> but if the little ones want to go, they can go inside the room. There's some little bit activities for them to do. Um, please don't forget your kids at the end of the evening. <laughs> we do have some families that try to leave the kids with us. No, we're going to make sure you guys all go and collect your kids. Hopefully you got an evaluation form when you came in. Um, this is our usual practice. If you fill out the evaluation form, when you turn it in, you'll have a nice a little makana from us just for appreciating your mana'o. Everything that you say and tell us is um, very serious, and we um, take it into consideration whenever the planning committee gets together to plan our next session. So it's not like you're just writing stuff to get the makana. For us, it's very important. Um, uh, again, I, I think I'm Paul. At this time, I'm going to call up uh, Angela. No, Angela's in the kitchen. Can't call Angela. It's me. Okay. Um, so at this time, what I want to do just to get us rolling is I'm going to uh, invite Uncle well, William Isla to come up. And he is going to be our facilitator for tonight's discussion. And then if our panelists can come up and um, take their seats over here, I'm going to be turning it over to them and then we'll be Mahalo, mahalo po. You guys want to come up to the table, and then while they while they're getting ready to do that, because I think we have a few more um, hokulea crew that are around somewhere, I'm going to ask Nainoa to come up because he wanted to just say a few words. Ah, come up, come up, Uncle John, and then Nainoa, if you could come to the the podium here and just share what you wanted to share with the community. Hello, um, Yeah, I, I'm not on the panel, I'm not trying to weasel in onto it either, but um, I, you know, I, I just wanted to simply come and, and thank Wainai for, you know, all that you've done for, yeah. and um, I mean, uh, you know, the, um, the Worldwide Voyage is not finished. It's, uh, it's finished in June of 2018, even though the kind of that world tour finished this past June. And, and the reason for that is that um, we have responsibility that, uh, on the voyaging side. Uh, and that is um, that you know, we made the bet that, let me put it this way, going around the world 37 months, 42,000 miles, 18 countries, <coughs> going as far south as South Island, New Zealand, as far north as Nova Scotia, trying to go around South Africa. It's not like the safest thing in the world to do. Um, 
And, you know, Hokulea is deeply cherished. And, um, and so us guys in the kind on the on the planning stage when you you find out how disconnected you are when you think you got it all figured out then some moment tells you you don't have it all figured out and, th and that was when um, one of those moments and there are many um, that we thought the worldwide voyage was a really good idea I'm not going to go into the intent it would take too much time it's and this is not about me but we thought it was a really good idea we thought Hawaii would be really behind it we thought that um, of course uh, our leadership in Hawaii would think that it's a good idea and would support it. Well, before we went on the worldwide voyage, I went, uh, it happened to be in Washington, D.C. And um, so I just, out of respect to our congressional delegation, went to see all of our delegates and um, to tell them about the great worldwide voyage. We're going to go around the world and they're going to love it and they're going to hug us and wish us well. Well, that didn't happen. One of our delegates that actually represents you um, stood up, grabbed my shirt, and said, I know you have no right to take Hokulea. It's not yours. Take Hokulea around the world. You have no right to do that. What if you lose it? And she said, I serve the ones that need the canoe the most. What if you don't bring it back? And um, pushed me away, and uh, so... That's the kind of moment you think, maybe this is all wrong. Maybe what you've done in isolation in your thinking and just the few colleagues of yours is all wrong. That maybe the risk is too high. And, um, and I slept on it for two days and thinking that maybe I better shut this thing down. But, um, and uh, what happened was um, I slept on it and I thought about it and I called her back up and said, you know, all due respect, um, we're going. We're going to go. Because for the very reason, the very reason you're saying that we might lose the canoe is why we need to serve it. It's our children. So that was one of the challenges. And the, the other challenge was um, the seed was planted for the worldwide voyage by a best friend of mine by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Lacey Veach. He was an astronaut. Kekioka Aina Ku Aina from this land. Second after Ellison on Izuka. Talked about the importance of the world, talked about it needed to be protected. You they'll have no idea how beautiful the island Earth is until you see the whole thing from space, but you gotta go protect it. And uh, we all need to protect it. You can't protect what you don't understand, and you won't if you don't care. And uh, and you can't do it by yourself. Take Hokale around the world. So it can learn the earth. So you have the knowledge base to be able to make good decisions about caring for something that is your home. And then he said, and then you need to connect with the world's peoples um, to be able to build a network of change. And uh, so he dies in 1995, lymphomelanoma, best friend, and then for 16 years, we would debate um, this idea about this importance of, of, of the, the idea of going around the world with Hokulea. And every time we would, the, the leadership in Hawaii would get together once a year and make decisions and votes on what we're going to do collectively, we would always start with the idea of the power of going around the world, of, about, the, about the idea of sailing around the world but then every time we would get into the debate about how dangerous that is, whether it's the hurricanes or it's the pirates or it's, it's the rogue wave of South Africa or it's the extratropical cyclones that are in every, especially in the Southern Oceans and, and all that kind of stuff, and then the mosquito and human violence and those issues, the debate would turn to unrealistic dreams and the vote would always be no. It would always be no. And then the... Um, April 1st, 2008, um, we got together. Together of us starting to listen to this new language on the earth. It's brand new to humanity because we don't understand it. We don't know it. But we're beginning to understand this issue about we're changing the earth and it's going to change us. And Lacey's question is, he don't think we're ready for the change. Uh, we don't know how to deal with the change. 
And so that was stuff like climate change. Or, or turning, turning up the thermostat and raising the sea levels and oceans, drowning islands and all that stuff. Acidification, uh, dead zones, hypoxia, all these stuff, this new language that we don't even understand. Nobody's fluent in it. And so the question is not but do we want to go around the world. The question all of a sudden didn't even become a question of going. The question was more about not this, it's more about responsibility. So the question was not about whether we should go around the world, but on the table on April 1st, 2008, where the leadership was there, was really what's more dangerous? The hurricane? The pirates? The rogue wave? Or staying tied to the dock and do nothing? And then, and then, then be honest enough to accept the fact that your future is going to be about ignorance and it's going to be about apathy, it's going to be about inaction. So we voted yes. And then the next challenge I'll share with you in the last one was we trained for five years. The worldwide voyage was supposed to leave Hawaii in May of 2013. But it's a kind when, you know, you're so busy that all you sense is there's something nagging you that's really, really wrong, but you can't surface it because you're so filled with the day-to-day -day stuff. You can't see it, but you can feel it. But for me, it's in my dreams. It's where I settle down, where I quiet down, like 2, 3 in the morning. And in March, it was like mid-March of 2013, a, a month and a half away from leaving, six weeks before we're going, canoes are ready, the crews are ready. But there was one question we never answered. And that's why it's relevant to hear. Why not? Well, as I woke up in that dream, that kind of dream, you're in the dream, but in a, in, a, in a fraction of a second, you're sitting up and going, wow, something's really wrong. And it was, we're ready to go, but does anybody care? Do children that are here today that never met Eddie Aikau, that never met Mao Piailu, that never met Ben Finney, do they care? And why would they if they didn't know? If we're saying the voyage is for children, um, how do we know that they're going to follow? And what if they don't? We're sailing by ourselves without purpose. So we stopped the voyage. We didn't. We actually said, okay, the first leg of the voyage is going to go around the Hawaiian Islands and go see if children come to the canoe. So we made a, a guess of like a, a target of um, 5,000. 5,000 students come. We got permission to go if they signed the log book. Well, we went around to about 30 ports. We went to maybe 60 communities. Uh, 32,000 school kids came down, um, signed the log book. So clearly there was permission to go. But the story I want to end with you where really where permission came was here. So when I say this is the actually we've had 32 different leg crew changes. We went to 18 countries, went to 334 ports worldwide. This is the most important stop of the worldwide voyage. Why not? Two reasons. This is for me personal, right? This is, I'm not speaking for everybody else. When we were in Waianae in 2013, the issue of permission was a moment in time, was a single night. Um, it was rough, so we were moored offshore. And it was about 11 o'clock at night, and um, rough, black, night. And there was some Hawaiian boy swam out to the canoe by himself in the dark, strong enough to climb the catwalk. Try it. Not many people can do it. Get himself on the canoe. He laid down all wet in the deck by himself, curled up, and laid on the canoe. Crew left him alone. The next morning, the boy was gone. He never signed the logbook. 
But that's why that was the moment we had permission. Because we know from that moment, that boy was telling us, we need this canoe to be the starlight, to constantly, constantly reinforce the need to be proud of who you are. Know where you come from. And make sure that you understand your ancestors were the best in the world. Coming to Waianae for me, because of that boy, and because when I know when we come to Waianae, this canoe is cared for. 24-hour watches with it uh, down at the, the Every time, it, it's a, a source of pride, and people come up. I don't know who they are, but you fed them today, and you'll feed them tomorrow, and you'll feed them the next day for the 21 days we'll be in Waianae. And maybe there were 3,200 uh, um, kids that came, but there'll be 2,500 kids will come in the nine days that we're serving the public schools in this coast. That's more than one third of every single child on this coast of school age. That's, and then you see the pouring of aloha and kindness to this canoe and the protection of it, the understanding this is sacred. And um, it just constantly reminds me of the power of community when it's united, when it's together, when it's forcibly. One would argue that Waianae is, is not like Kahala or it's not like Silicon Valley uh, and is measured sometimes on the wrong kinds of metrics. But when it comes to being community that can accomplish amazing things with, this, with apparently so little, that's the story. And so I want to thank John Cruz for coming to Kauai to be here today. And Dwayne DeSoto is you know, one of our top sailors on board. And I want us to all take a moment, just a quiet moment, to send a prayer out to, to Buff. Having a rough time today. You'll be okay. It's kind of pretty cranky in here, right, Brian? Because um, uh, he wants to be. And um, but I came for for Buff, and I came for just to say thank you. That's all. Real simple. But in in doing so, at least I know you know that I care. That you heard that words of gratitude to all of you, that strengthen and empower everything we do. Everything we do. I don't know the boy, I don't know who he is, but he is the light. And I do want to thank <coughs> Kaina, is that Kaina um, Holomalie, who Captain Hokolea here. <laughs> and I want to thank Sam Kapoi for Captain Hikianalia here. And I do want to thank Brian. Oh. Archie Kalepa one day sent me, he said, no, no, you need to go look at this. Uh, and that was back when we didn't have, you know, telephones that you could send pictures and all that kind of stuff. But, and I'll never forget it. Um, he said, hey, no, no, go watch this. It was that poor Japanese man in Yokohama that fell off the rocks and the surf was so big it slammed him into the cave and, uh, <coughs> and he probably had another 15 minutes to live. But Brian came on his jet ski. It's on film, you should see that. Where he comes in with his friend with just that both experience and just his <coughs> very deep innate knowing about the oceans that comes from his father, his father's father, his ancestors that Nobody else knows and timed it in between these waves. He had one wave, or that man dies. And uh, got off the jet ski, went into the rocky cave, pulled the man out, and, and got him onto the ski, and this huge wave came in and broke. And it, it was a matter of seconds. It was like the greatest recorded act of heroism I have ever seen, ever. And so when we are in the, the light of the Keolanas, it's a... Uh, it's a light that reminds me of this power of this place, this coast, how strong it is and, and, and how beautiful it is. And uh, so to the Kailanas, to Dwayne, to John and Kaina and Sam need to get up here, please, to the 
podium, not my Instagram, but they need to be at some time. And, uh, and, um, and thank you to you all, and, and thank you for the time and allowing me to be here. Hey, I gotta go home. My kids are on the east side. They're going to bed. I gotta be there. <laughs> Mahalo for the time that you give to everyone, Nainoa, and Before you leave, I just want to say one thing, and that is um, that is the world, the world actually needed Hokolea to go around, and it it needed to not highlight, but it needed to sort of kindle. Um, all of the people who are indigenous to every place, their kuleana for their aina. And one of the challenges in Malama Honua was, what are you going to pledge to do in the next years to change things? And on Hokulea, every place that it went, there was this pledge crate, whatever you want to call it, that was filled to the brim by the time that they made it up to New York and presented to it to the United Nations. So I think mahalo from this community um, for hearing the kahea from the rest of the world, especially the, the youth who are empowered now to do something about these new words and these new phrases that we will have to deal with. And there's this commitment to deal with it now. So enjoy the safe trip home. Enjoy your mo children. Mahalo. So one of the most difficult things to do is to follow Nainoa after he speaks. I can tell you that. Because there's no passion, yeah? There's that unbridled passion and that connection to something that is much, much greater. So my job tonight is to um, ask these gentlemen to come and introduce themselves and ask them uh, some questions. And then after... I get an opportunity to ask them questions, then the audience will get an opportunity to ask them questions. So think about the questions that you might ask of them um, if we do not have this opportunity to do so. So I know I introduced everyone already, so what I will do is I will ask, going from um, out of respect, maybe Kupuna, <laughs> Uncle, we won't, we won't, yeah, Uncle John Cruz, would you? Introduce yourself, where are you from? Um, where, where, you, where did you go to school? A little bit about your background and then your connection to this, this moku, moku o waianai. Um, aloha, um, you don't, I don't need this. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is John Cruzy. Um, people think, wow, oh, John Cruz. I said, no, no, that's the entertainer. So one day I met John Cruz. And we were up on the big island. So John Cruz meets John Cruz. I said, hey, you know what? People think you're me and I'm you. He goes, sign my album. And yeah, you can sign a Hokulea picture. So that's been going on for, so you might not even have one Hokulea picture with <laughs> John Cruz, C-R-U-Z versus John Cruz, K-R-U-S-E. That's me. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here. Um, uh, we... Um, how did I get started? Uh, I came home from the service and I met uh, Kimo Hugo, an old classmate of mine. And he had with him uh, Herb Connie. And this was, I was going to night school and my, um, you know, after you came home from Vietnam, I would say uh, the, the canoe found, found several of us rather than we found the, we found the canoe. I'm gonna introduce you, you gotta use the mic because they're recording this, thank you. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, um, we, uh, we all got together and um, that's how I got uh, involved with the Hokulea. So for the last 42 years, I've been on this quest. Uh, so I got to work on Hokulea, I got to build Hokulea, got to sail Hokulea. And so I've been on pretty much a lot of the voyages, and I got to go on the world, the worldwide, uh, on the worldwide voyage. Um, 
one of the stops on that worldwide voyage was uh, for me, um, we did a haul out for three weeks in Cape Town, South Africa. And Cape Town, if you have been there or haven't been there, Cape Town is a is a tourist town. And you know, we where we were working at this place, the Radisson Hotel, which was on Greenpoint, right on the water, we hauled up Hokulea in a private dry dock right below our hotel. So we would walk, go up to our room and go down and work on the canoe and then walk back up. Um, so one of these um, one of these days we were at, oh, it's it's uh, Thanksgiving. They don't know Thanksgiving in Cape Town. So we went to eat. I remember eating at the, this place called the Butcher Block. And so several of us, Bruce Blakenfield, Bruce's father, uh, Keloa Ho, myself, Kimo Lyman, Nakua, Lynn, and uh, Bob Perkins and Mike Cunningham. We all lived in this hotel uh, and there's two, two floors above the Hokulea. So we went to eat on Thanksgiving night and they brought this menu out and said, you can eat anything you want. So they had pictures of zebra, buffalo, Cape Buffalo, <laughs> Elan, um, anything you wanted. So because it was Thanksgiving, they didn't have turkey, so I ate ostrich. <laughs> Pretty good. So after this whole dinner was, was finished, Kimu Lyman, Kilo, and myself, we walked back to the hotel. It was about a mile from the, uh, from the restaurant. And as you know, or maybe don't know, Cape Town, 9 o'clock, they close up. It's a tourist town. So here's these three knuckleheads walking back to their, uh, to their hotel. And the blue and white goes past us, turns around, comes back. Guy rolls the window down, big flashlight. And he goes, Hokulea. I said, yeah. So then he calls two backup guys on this dispatch. These two other police come. They're on segways. They pull up to you and they go, hop on, mate. I look at him. I grabbed the back of his, his waist. He took me to a hotel. So Keloa. This is the funny part. Keloa rode with the, with the guy in the car. And so Keloa asked him, hey, um, how come you don't have homeless? How come this place is so clean? And the guy, the police looks, he goes, we don't have homeless. I said, what if you have homeless? They said, we have homeless. We pick them up, we put them in our squad car. We take them 20 miles outside the city. We let them go. If they want to walk back, we pick them up again and take them out. But outside there, there is hyenas, jackals, um, tigers. They might not make it back. A lot of them don't make it back. So you're going, wow, it's kind of heavy. I was going, I, I, you know, to me, I was thinking, you know, everybody got to have a place. But that's one of these kind of weird stories that you'll probably hear from me tonight. Um, um, the connection to Waianae, um my auntie used to live up um, Cornet store that, what is it, Makaha Road? And uh, her name was uh, Tuera um, Pilts, but she was married to a Tavares. They had a pig farm up in the valley. And um, my, my, my mother, that was my mother's sister. And so I'm German Hawaiian on my father's side from Kauai. And on my mother's side, I'm German Hawaiian uh, Cook Island Maori. So, um, yeah, I got, I got some, I think, sailing in me. I can, you know, I got fortunate that I was lucky to meet Herb Connie at that time. And so, you know, during that time, the Vietnam War was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was stupid. You know, like all wars is stupid. And, it, and you know, so Hokulea found me, and Hokulea found uh, Shorty Bertelman. Hokulea found Snake Ahi, Hokulea found Roger Ka'avaloa, Hokulea found Buff, Hokulea found Billy Richards, always in the service. And now you think to yourself, these are the same guys that are still hanging on, you know. I mean, so now all these 40, 20 years of the 40 years, I came back and uh, we wanted to build a canoe for Kauai. 
So we started, uh, Dr. Ayu, uh, Dennis Chun, and myself. We're three old Hokulea crew members. So we raised funds and we built this canoe called the Namahoe. And that, when Nainoa came back from uh, this recently in June, we first time we put Namahoe in the water and we sailed it to um, Oahu. And so in that idea of building this canoe, uh, uh, Dwayne had uh, yeah, on his shirt, Eva'a emoku, emoku eva'a. And the idea is that you build a canoe um, with the idea that, yeah, you're, you're going to pass this on to the, the young people, to people who want to learn about this. And uh, we, uh, in that time, I was really fortunate. I was in the right place at the right time. So uh, again, thank you for letting me speak. Mahalo, Uncle John. One, one, one quick follow-up question. Um, did the ostrich come with stuffing? Oh, hey, the ostrich was, uh, it, it was tender. It, it didn't even taste like, tur you know, turkey. And the, the guy said, no, this is ostrich. We don't have turkey. Those guys, they eat a lot of meat and potatoes. Because South Africa is, there's uh, English, um, African, which is Dutch German, um, Shaka Zulu, Khoisan. Uh, these are all, you got, there's 11 different languages in South Africa, official languages. And the, the, the one that the black people know more is uh, Khoisan. And Khoisan is a dialect of uh, Zosa and... Um, what is those Bantu? You know the little guys. It, it's a they're so when you hear them talking, they're all clicking. They click, they they click when they talk. You know, yeah, yeah. Just an another language. Sound like a lot of knowledge was exchanged, and you brought back a lot with you. So Brian, uh, you're next, Brian. Um, can you? No need to introduce your family background because I think we pretty much know. But what? What, uh, what is your connection to Wainai besides your family? And then, you know, why why is Wainai so special to you and the and the man that you've become? Well, I I think you know be, before you talk about connection, it's you know to understand the, the disconnection you know, because a lot of our kids and you know growing up, a lot of kids disconnected. You know, either with our culture, <coughs> our families, or even values. Um, when I was growing up, all I wanted to be was a pro surfer, travel, and, you know, of course, you know, being, I was around the, the ocean and, and my father and stuff also too, teaching us about the ocean and winning all these contests. So I got sponsored and I got to travel. But I think, you know, that dream of going away and, and being famous and, you know, all these kind of things, travel around the world, you don't truly know what you really have until you away until you kind of like, you know, now you miss the things that you treasure the most, you know. So it was that disconnection that really brought me back, you know, to understanding who we and why I'm so proud of, of this whole coastline. You know, the, growing up in that family atmosphere, you know, my mom and dad, everyone who walked on our beach, everyone who walked I mean, and swam into our ocean became part of our families. It doesn't matter where you came from. Dad would go out, we were never rich in, in money, but man, talk about rich in knowledge. Dad would go out and he would catch fish, guys bag boys, make guys go cut wood, and he feed the whole beach, everybody. So it was one happy, you know, lifestyle, childhood, where we never went hungry. And that's this whole coastline, and that's why I'm so proud about wh where we come from. You know, my father has voyaged um, on Hokulea the first time and around, and, and I, I was involved as a teenager you know for me you know hokulea for me was like six flags you know i was i was having good fun you know going up there we and you know dad was like hey this is survival this is not we you know so anyway but that that's the thing and stuff and i tell you the biggest voyage that i involve in with hokulea is right now you know the community being part of what we're doing with our kikis down at the beach and stuff every day you know i me Dwayne. 
Kainan, Sam, all us guys and stuff down here, Shar, everybody who involved in the community with what's going on at Pokaiwe, if you come there and you just listen, you can close your eyes, go lay on the beach and just listen, you hear the kids olelo. I mean, they're professors beyond me. You know, they speak more Hawaiian than, than I can. I used to speak Hawaiian when I was a small kid with my grandmother, but, you know, not anymore. And, and it's, you know, laziness on top of me where I can always relearn and stuff too. But it's just proud to see our kids instill those values and, and they're learning about our, our culture in a, in a canoe. And one of the biggest things too is that, you know, in the Western world, we're always taught to own things. But in our world, we stewards of the ocean, we stewards of the land. You know, the land owns us, the ocean owns us. And when we say own, because the give back is the knowledge that we gain from the land, the knowledge that we gain from the ocean. So these are the things that I've grown up in and my connection in all of Hawaii and I and, and my family. When I talk my family, it's not Kevalana family. It's the family everywhere from Nanakuli all the way to Kaina Point. And then we know each other, you know, every single, you know, buddy and stuff too. But, and I think it's what um, I know I was saying that uh, the inaction, <laughs> I, I give you one, uh, one story. You know, I go around the world teaching about ocean risk management. I train a lot of the military. I train the government in, in a lot of ocean safety. I just did the safety summit on the North Shore with all the um, biggest surfers from around the world. And we're going around talking about rules and regulation about, uh, and William knows all about this, um, around the whole island of Oahu. And we're talking about, you see all these red zones on, you know, east side, and all these other rules and regulations of, you know, south side town. And when you look on the leeward side, oh, no more rules. <laughs> yeah. And the, and the guys, all the, all the big wave riders go, Wow, look at that, man, oh, your side, hey, no more rules. So I go, you know, there's a difference between permits and permission, you know? You gotta go get permission before you get permits. You know, it, over here, one thing about nature, God will never look at your certification, you know? It's, it's what you know here and here. The other part too is the biggest enforcement down our side is not people over here in the call of cops. They're gonna call grandma and grandpa. And that's the enforcement that you're going to get. You know, it's the families that are going to get involved. And that's what I'm so proud about this side is because we engage. Yes, we argue. Yes, we fight. But we work our difference out and we engage. And that's one thing that I really don't like to lose on this side is that ability to converse, the ability to talk, the ability to adapt and change. But anyway, that's my connection. Thank you. Mahalo, Brian. Let's start closest to me. Uh, Dwayne, no need to go over your family background because I think everybody here also knows. So same kind of connection. What, 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 is a, what, was it, what is it about Waianae growing up in Waianae with your family and then the connection to the canoe that makes, you know, nobody said it more eloquently than I know, what makes it special, this place special? Well, thank you, first of all, everybody, for coming tonight and supporting Hokulea. It is a truly incredible mission that has been taking place. And uh, I get to be one of the younger generations to get involved. And it's it's been such an honor and a pleasure to give my time to Hokulea. And I think that everyone in here should first realize that all of you can be involved with Hokulea on some level. Um, and it is a privilege. Some people don't understand that. And that's what Makaha gave me in my life growing up over here was respect for the people you have around you, respect for yourself. You were I was taught to be proud of myself. I was taught to be a champion by my family, my extended family. Real similar to how Brian was saying, we, we grew up on the beach, very competitive but not in a competitive way to hurt each other, but in a competitive way that if I get better, then he's gonna get better. And if he gets better, then I'm gonna get better. And we're looking at each other and we feed off each other. We feed off of that success. And we see the pathway of where we can go in life. And I was watching Rusty and Brian and learning from my cousins and my uncles how to be 
how to be a part of this beach that was a family. It wasn't about me being a DeSoto and them being a Kealana. It was about when I came out of the water and I was eight years old, I could surf at Makaha by myself without my parents because I had my whole family over there. I had everybody watching. And when I came out of the water, there was food on the barbecue, whether it was Uncle Buff or Auntie Rel catching a kala or Uncle Bruce catching a kala and putting it on the barbecue for everybody to share. And, and, you, and you don't know how important that is because you say, oh, man, I don't have money. This sucks, right? And you grow up thinking, oh, this is junk. I don't have more money. My surfboard is ugly. All these guys come to Makaha with these nice surfboards. I get the brown one. I get uncle's old one. <laughs> like, oh, wow. But I got to go and, and learn from the best surfers in the world, which gave me an opportunity to travel the world. The watermen that I grew up around and the water women that I grew up around set a platform that the whole world got to learn from. And I'm not joking, what Uncle Brian does with ocean safety is teaching the entire world. The platform that guys like Duke Ahanamoku set for us gave the whole world a sense of what we are and where we are. And I get to go around and be a part of that legacy every single time. And when I'm out there, I realize I'm traveling in France. It's lonely. I'm traveling in South Africa. It's lonely. You get to see the diversity. You realize, whoa, South Africa got it worse than us. No matter how rough you thought your life was, and then you see Rio de Janeiro at 16 years old, and you're like, oh, these guys got it rough compared to what we got. And you start thinking, wow, I, had, I have and had so much great things. But it wasn't money. It was the way we were treating each other, respecting each other. I mean, guys got beat up in the water because they almost hit me, and I don't know who beat them up. Somebody saw it happen and they got smashed because they were the kook in the water. And I don't even know, looking around, this poor guy is all bust up, but somebody went, was pissed off at the guy for almost hitting me. And you realize you're, you're, you're blessed to be protected in such a way. And we, and we got to guard our coastline. You know, like we, they say no more rules. We're not the first ones to complain. That's why there's not a ton of rules out here because we're going to handle it. We're going to call Uncle William. And find out, <laughs> find out his opinion on what's going on and how to handle things. We're going to call Uncle Brian. For real. Because we're going to learn how to handle it internally. Not like on Cry Baby, you know. Go around and whine to the cops and whine to these guys. But handle it talking. Handle it face to face. Like real men, real women do. Not hide behind somebody else's power. And, and we had, it, it's, just, it's just tremendous to come home and sit at Makaha Beach and just see how golden and how beautiful and how wonderful this coastline is. It doesn't matter some of the stripes we have because right now you can just see the community engaging, getting stronger through the language, through the, through the sports. You know, when Why Not wins a football game, it's, it's crazy how everybody's excited. And that, and that doesn't happen to too many places. That doesn't happen. And we, and Going on to Hokulea seemed like an extension of what was happening at Makaha Beach. I didn't learn how to sail until I was about 32 and jumped on with the guys. You know, these guys, Sam and Kaina, they've been there a lot longer and from a lot younger. And it was just like, I felt, oh, I'm a new kid on the block coming into their territory and learning from them all the stuff they spent half their life already doing. And it's like, okay, wow, how much more can, a, can a eight islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean achieve? How much more awesomeness when you're talking about surfing, you're talking about sailing by the stars. This place is, is like a gift of creating natural talent and a gift of creating these platforms of utilizing Mother Nature to its perfection in a Pono way. And, and that's where it's just, you know, a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this coastline and be a part of Hokulea. Sam, Kapoi, the same kind of question, brother. So share with us. Uh, 
Hello, my Kaku. Uh, yeah, mahalo for coming and uh, putting us on the spot. <laughs> uh, my, my connection to I and I uh, runs deep, yeah, with, uh, with, with our Ohana Poi, um, you know, great leaders like Miley Kukahi. Um, and I think, you know, kind of echoing what Duane was saying is that's the, that's the greatness that we come from is, is from, you know, greater past leaders that came before us. And so, um, so yeah, so got to mahalo them for sure. Um, and then, uh, I was fortunate enough for, for be a part of an awesome program called Hawaiian Studies in White and I High School, public school, baby, represent. And, um, you know, we, uh, uh, again, we was fortunate enough to have solid uncles and aunties at that time that, that saw the vision that White and I needed our own canoe, and um, they built on canoe called Eala, you know, the, the third canoe in the, the current Moku Alhau of Va'a. And um, so, yeah, so getting, on, getting involved in high school with, with Eala and uh, eventually seeing Hokulea, um, like, you know, two feet away on the dock, pulling in with Ho'i Loa at that time, and Nainoa jumping off, and at, at Sand Island, I told him, bah, I like, I like, see all that canoe. <laughs> He's like, okay, shoot, we go. <laughs> it was that simple. I was like, oh, okay, shoot, we go. Um, and then, you know, you just want, that, that's the palu, yeah? that's, the, that's that, that, that ono that, uh, a lot of our kids like search for, um, you know, like Uncle John said, the timing was 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 right, and uh, the the hook went set in deep. You know what I mean? And and you can't, it's hard for spit them out. You know what I mean? Once you get that that taste, um, cause uh, what is that? From like 15 years old, you know, you, <laughs> you watch all these kind Holly movies that you see all this this white boys sailing and stuff and. And I, you know, I, I look around now, like I, I was like, bro, where all the brown kids? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> for real? I mean, that's true. You know, you go all, all this yacht clubs and all this stuff. Like, I can get so much holidays. Like, I thought we was the killer sailors and the voyagers. But it's just, you know, you kind of think of stuff that, you know, the, the suppress or rip away from our people. Yeah? And so, um, I think that's why we do them for, for provide that space and opportunity for, um, for our kids for. Uh, it, you know, I guess uh, engage in that activities because sailing is you know it's a privilege nowadays because it's so much work and all that kind of stuff that happening uh, and bills and whatever when you hit adult life and so I still wonder to myself like how am I able to do this <laughs> uh, you know sail around the world on on, on canoe um, and uh, and and continue for living this modern society and so. I still trying to figure that out. So, uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I guess when you make it your one lifestyle and 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 live it, and not just one weekend sailor, I guess you know where um, stuff like this continue to happen. And so, um, yeah, a little bit mahalo. <laughs> <clears throat> So both Sam and Kaina was out cooking, so part of the cow cow that you ate tonight was uh, part of the hard work, and uh, you know that's what it is. That's what it takes, right? It's a uh, it's caring for one another, right? So, Kaina, your story. Hello, my kaku. I'd like to thank Nainoa for this lovely opportunity. Um, wasn't planning on speaking. Um, but but I, I do believe our teachers are there to test us and never to set us up for failure. And um, so, aloha. My name is Kaina Nakani Aloha from Waianae Nalakuli um, on the west side. Um, I got involved with Hokulea um, through a program named the Ocean Learning Academy that was started by Nainoa Thompson back in 2001. Um, I attended Nanakuli High School and I uh, graduated at ninth grade. I was so smart. <laughs> um, and for, for a couple of years, so 
I never liked go to school because it was kind of hard for to go to school when you can see the waves breaking. Um, from Nanakuli, you can see depots, subland, you can see the whole coast, and kind of hard for staying in school. Um, so about ninth grade, my parents tried to homeschool me, and same thing, before they wake up, grab my butt, and I'm gone. <laughs> see the headlights turning into the into depots, and you know, you're going to get lickings, but you're going to do them again tomorrow. Um, so when I heard um, of this program that was based off of the ocean um, with Hokulea, um, that's pretty much everything that I wanted. Um, I wasn't a student that would go to school, read a book, and you know, take a test, and that's how your teachers would judge you as an F student. Um, I thought that was actually my name growing up. You're, you're an F student. I even got one U. I don't know if you guys got U's as a grade, but I, I don't know what is that. I thought it was ugly or something, but did um, undesirable. Undesirable. <laughs> F was fine. <laughs> yeah, I thought F was so fantastic. Um, and so you know, then again, I can go home and build a house over your head. And so who's the F student? But when I left school, I didn't give up on learning. It was the style of teaching. And um, luckily, about two years later, and I know I started a program named the Ocean Learning Academy. Um, it was for 12 students from around the whole state. Um, we all tried out for this program. Me and my older brother McKenna was, was the two from the west side that made it in. Um, and, through <coughs> and through this program, um, I was able to meet great teachers. Um, a lot of guys that, that um, you know, you heard their names, you seen them on posters, you seen them in the news, and now you're standing next to them on the, on the deck of Hokulea, um, heroes that you heard about. Um, and that's how I got involved with, with Hokulea. And um, from then, I just continued um, staying around Hokulea. I mean, we all have a, a long story and whatnot. Um, you know, living here on the west side, we sometimes we don't know all the positive options out there. And um, got sucked into a lot of the negative options that I knew about at that time. And it was Hokulea that, that um, you know, came into my life and, and saved me and um, kind of showed me a new set of stars and constellations. Um, and in, in navigation and in voyaging, yeah, you're always looking up at the stars and, you know, keep your head up. Um, and always shooting for the stars. But I was able to meet great, great teachers um, and to share with them, be able to talk story with them. Um, and through Hokulea, I was able to, you know, learn more about myself, who I was as a person and as, as a Hawaiian Polynesian growing up in these modern times. And as I started to learn more about myself, I started to stand up straighter. You get more pride, who you are. Um, at that time, you know, the stereotypes we knew about Y and I was like, every time you introduce yourself, well, if I'm Y and I, usually the person takes a step back. Um, you know, think you get false crack or something. And, um, you know, you're drug addicts, uh, chronics, and whatnot. And that was a stereotype that, that people knew. And, um, one day I just told myself, you know, I didn't want my kids growing up with that same story, that same stereotype. I wanted them to say, you know, we come from the place of, you know, the most world champions in, in the world, uh, 96792, uh, the most world champion surfers, um, the greatest sailors, um, the youngest MMA fighter to win, yeah? So, and you know, now having the biggest halal in the state down at when I Boat Harbor um, because of Eala is, uh, you know, the story that I hope my kids was, would tell one day, yeah, and even uh, stand more proud than I did. And um, Hokulea has taken me all over the world. I met great people. Uh, my first voyage leaving Hawaii ever was, was to Okinawa, Japan, um, flying to, to Palau, sailing to Yap, and then to Micronesia um, at 19 years old. And was able to, to be at the table when I heard and I know them talking about sailing around the world. Um, what would it take? One, it would take a, a safe canoe, a strong canoe, and two, it would take great sailors to keep up with that canoe. And um, so that's pretty much when the seed was replanted in me again uh, to, to kind of go back to school to learn the arts, the crafts, and 
really, you know, get documents that prove you know how to do these things. And um, was <clears throat> was was an unreal feeling. Um, being at that table and listening to these guys talk about going around the world. And so, one, I wanted to, you know, train myself better um, and also to make one canoe that, that can bring our crew home safely. And so going back to school, learning from other sailors and, and builders of fiberglass canoes and coal canoes, I was able to kind of bridge the gap of between the two. And in rebuilding Hokulea, um, I had the privilege of being one of those, the supervisors and in charge of, of a lot of the projects um, in rebuilding the masts, the spars, the railings, the manus, the decks that we walk on, the mo'os, um, and being able to bridge that gap between the two generations and making her a stronger, faster, safer canoe. Um, so 19 months of dry dock and um, I don't know, 400,000 hours of volunteer hours coming down, we created the new hokulea but still with that old sacred spirit that she always had, that same va'a magic that, that Uncle Clay always talked about. Um, and he goes, Minamuni magic. Minamuni magic. <laughs> they go all night, tie the canoe. <laughs> Work on the canoe all night. Yeah, and so even on, on weekends, we, you know, um, lashing to get a hokulea back together, we would run these... Um, Minuhuni weekends, Minuhuni weekends, um, just 24 seven, just going, lashing and working and you get tired, you go sleep, take a nap, get back up and everybody's still working and just taking turns. And within two weekends, we had Hokulea lash back together, um, almost four miles a line, lashing her back together. Um, and on her first voyage, leaving Hawaii, you know, get into to Tahiti in 15 days, um, was was a great feeling as 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 a builder um, to to know that she got there half the time than when she first started sailing, um, but then one of our our, um, our uncles, our good friends, uh, Uncle Tava, uh, we was at Hakipu cruising when Hokulea was getting ready for sale, and he said, you know, you're not a canoe builder until your canoe returns home, and again, a seed was planted. Now you got to continue to train crew members. Um, to keep up with this canoe and safely bring her home. And uh, even though we wasn't out there sailing, physically there, um, training as much people as I could and teaching as much as I could so that when they go out, safely return home safely to their families and um, just unreal for see what Hokulea has done. I had the privilege of sailing from Bali down to Mauritius, Africa, um, across the Indian Ocean. Uh, was an unreal, unreal sail, but was was unreal to see the different cultures in the world and I guess how environment is looked at and um, human waste and whatnot. And um, not to bring up too much bad things about Bali, it was a great place, but when we got there to see Hokulea sitting in this boat harbor, and you look, you see a dog in the middle of the harbor standing on trash on the ocean, being able to walk across trash um, was unreal. And to see how people just think you know, we dirty the beach today, no worry, the high tide's gonna come and take it out. Uh, morning, it'll be gone. Um, and then to go to places like, like Mauritius, kind of like Hawaii, Oahu, um, to see where things are most industrialized, you start to find more substance abuse and, and homelessness. But places where you still had connection, places like in Tonga, Samoa, you know, you still had connection where you still know who you were from, where you came from. You know, never have homelessness. You wouldn't let your brother sit on the side of the road and, and you know, suffer. Um, and so it was, it was a real great eye-opener for me sailing around the road and, and seeing all of this and wanting to come back home and um, create another po positive option out there for our, our keikis walking around the streets today. And um, Eala is, is a big part of that. Eala was the first canoe that I seen. My older brother, Laakea, was part of the... Uh, Ocean Academy at Waina High School in class of 98 uh, when I seen Eala sail into Hakipu. And I think for me that was when the, the seed was first planted of what is this canoe? What is this? Why did everybody drive from Waina all the way down here to watch all the students come inside and you look on the beach, you see everybody standing up like what is this? What is this magic? I want it. Um, and 
pretty much. At that time, I thought, you know, you had to be related to Nainoa Thompson or <laughs> you had to be related to Kamehameha or something for Sehalan Hokulea. Um, but after getting on board with Hokulea and, you know, meeting Nainoa, um, and he said, you know, the canoe doesn't belong to me, it belongs to you, I'm just borrowing it for now. Um, you know, and I think of it the same way. I'm only on board for now and do as much as we can. And so the guys that come behind us, um, you know, our teachers set the bar and we expect them to raise that bar and be better than us. And um, why not with that attitude and whatnot, you know, go big or go home. That's what helped me throughout my sailing career and sailing life. Um, you know, that fear of big waves running away from them. Ah, not, not too bad because we face that here on the streets every day. Yeah, that pressure, that stress. Um, so it was nothing big. Uh, it was just another day on the ocean out there. Um, the Indian Ocean was, was pretty crazy. Um, we had a man overboard. A wave broke on the canoe and pulled a crew member right off the canoe um, in the middle of the morning. And, you know, doing what we was trained to do was able to get him back on safely. But it makes you really appreciate, you know, every second of your life. Um, every wave could be your last. And um, what we do today, you know, reflects on what we leave behind tomorrow. So, mahalo. Mahalo kay na. <coughs> such, such EK captured by this panel right over here. And, it, you know, I think you folks in this worldwide voyage going around actually started these um, Menihuni lashing parties in each port that you stopped at because that's part of the fabric of um, lashing the world together, right? The values that were shared, the message, the challenge um, for the next generation. What what are we gonna do? How are we gonna meet those challenges? So, my kai, uh, we'll start over here and then we'll just go down the way. Um, one quick funny story about Hukulea, your experience. Uh. Or scary, if you want to go that oh way. Okay. <laughs> that's a, that's probably one. So, <laughs> so the, my my first uh, voyage was going across uh, the Tasman Sea from Aotearoa to Australia, and you you get on board with a crew that you've only been able to train with for maybe six weeks. Uh, some of these people you're meeting for the first time. And they're coming from all over the state. Some guys are coming from Alaska. Depends which leg you're on. And uh, we get out into the Tasman, and there's this one day that there's like 30 foot high swells. Finally, it's like 15 feet, then like a 20 foot couple of days, and then finally, you know, some big swell. And you feel like, oh, this is getting real. And, and the canoe is getting harder and harder to steer. So less and less of the crew can actually steer the hoy. And um, the first thing I, I realized what was the profound was how awesome Hokulea was engineering-wise and construction-wise. Um, the way the yakos, the lashing, and the double hulls created such a smooth, silky flow through the ocean in the big swell with lots of wind. And when I was looking back at our escort boat just getting slammed back and forth, bam, 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 you're just like, oh. This, you, you, you look back on your canoe, you look back at the, the guys on the, the, the sailboat getting slammed, and you know they're getting sick, and you realize this is thousands and thousands of years of technology built into this canoe. And it's actually more superior than what exists around the world right now. It's far beyond what you see anywhere else. And so it was like real comforting, like, oh, this is amazing. We are coming off the Ike of, our, of ancestors that really put the thought and the time, the dedication, you know, to learn this and apply it to the va'a. And as it's getting rougher and rougher, you see certain guys, only one guy out of four is steering for four hours. And you're kind of going, whoa, that's not safe now. The reason why we have four-man crews is so that when we're sailing, we all take our time. Like in a four-hour shift, you all, sh you all share the steering. And if the waves are going to be this big for a couple of days, I cannot even sleep. My brain's going to go crazy knowing only one guy is steering on the whole four-hour shift. And so it started to, started to sink in and watch the crew and realize the weaker ones, the stronger ones, and realize, okay, some of us got to step it up a little bit more 
and hold it together. And, and, it, and it, didn't really, it didn't really last. It was only one big day. And, um, but it just, the, the moment I realized, wow, I never even thought it was going to be dangerous. All I know is Uncle Bruce Blankenfeld said I can go. And I said, yes. <laughs> and then I realized well, there is maybe a chance of it being risky out here. And, oh, wow. And then the waves died down. And we're all rapping about it, kind of reflecting on the, how it was. And in my crew, we had our doctor, this little Filipino lady, super awesome lady, right? Mariam Chang. And she, she had, she's sitting there, and she couldn't steer. But in the first two days, she was hiding in her, in her tent. Like, she couldn't come out. She was sick as a dog. But she wanted, when we came on board and steered in the big days, she sat on deck, scared to death now. And, and watched us. And she told us later, I was so scared, but I watch you standing on the hoy, screaming, you catch this wave, and you're like, chee-hoo! <laughs> we caught this three, three wave, you know, one wave, one wave, one wave, and it was, we were having so much fun. She thought, well, if you guys are having that much fun, we're gonna be okay, <laughs> you know? We're obviously gonna be fine, but it was like interesting to hear her perspective too and realize that like, she knew she couldn't do it. She was going to be there to support, and we were there to bring that comfort to her that everything is fine. And really, it all came back down to that va, that engineering is superior. And that's one thing, uh, traditional knowledge is something that, funny as can be, sustainability is coming back, right? And that's, oh, hello, you know? That's not a new thing, but they put a new word on it, and they put a new spin on it, and then they try to sell it to the world. And that's just knowledge that has been here for thousands of years that we were trying so hard to ignore. And that's, you know, so great to see the realization, so great to be a part of, like, this is the best there is. This is the best you can ever get sitting on the bar. Mahalo, Dwayne. Brian? <clears throat> guy that's always worried about safety oh. or funny because that scary part was funny yeah yeah <laughs> i think my whole life was about you know i mean the word safety and stuff i grew up in and around that my father you know being the first lifeguard at, at Macaw, um she's you know so much life lessons you know i, I, I tell you this one story um me being one teenager working under my dad and um, there, there was this CETA program, and I was on Lifeguard Aid. And the waves was really big, like what it is right now. And just my father being on a towel and stuff. And, and I tell you, this one had this tourist got caught in a big wave, and he got ripped in the rip current going near shore sideways. And then the guy yelling for help, and I jump off the towel, and I start running. And then right before I get to the edge of the beach, my dad whistles. And, you know, growing up, and some of you guys know your parents, when they whistle, you better stop and turn around, <laughs> no matter what you're doing. You know, so I stopped, looked back at my dad, and he, he's going like this, like, wait. And I go, what? The guy's drowning. And the guy's yelling for help. So the, the wife comes running up to me, and she goes, are you the lifeguard? And Ovia says, you know, ocean safety officer. And, and I feel dumb, so I go, yeah. <laughs> and and had my dad walking real slow behind me. And, and this guy drowning, he's he coming almost right in front. And I looking at my dad going, man, he not so what? Let me go, you know? So then um, all of a sudden, my dad yelling at the guy, stand up. So, <laughs> so then the, the wife looking at him and going, what? And the, the wife yelling, he said to stand up. So the guy stands right up. And then dad goes, walk towards me. So the guy walks right up, right? So then dad grabs him by the shoulder. He goes, first of all, thank God, okay? Look up. <laughs> Second of all, you was caught in a rip. They're on sandbar right here. So the next time you jump in, you get caught in a rip, just stand up in a sandbar and walk straight up. <laughs> so, you know, as a kid, I don't realize the lesson, right? Because my father went empower him knowledge that he, he may, you know, people may never be there for, for save you, but he gave him the knowledge to save himself. And that's one of the lessons in my life that I always carried to where I train people around the world now in some of the top military people and government agencies, just the simple things of, of my father's, you know, common sense. And he takes that common sense 
and you know on the hokulea and and just in life in general to all his grandkids to everybody and stuff like that and that's just you know like how he is in Wainai. i mean he had one funny one and and, and this is us guys being koloi on the canoe hokulea because again i wasn't part of the um road voyage but i was in the beginning stages where dad was first you know with everybody else learning the canoe so we had all the beach boys and dad had the beach boys and we sailing the coast and going to makua so the wind stopped picking up so of course all us guys we cheating in we trying to get more wind and all that and then we see the dolphins so me and and some of my other friends we go under the canoe so we grabbing the ropes and we body surfing and the canoe flying and we were out in the ocean, but Dad, he didn't know we were under the boat. So, so, so we body surfing, and the dolphins jump in by us, and we're going, yeehaw, yeehaw, yeehaw. And my dad went throw this line, you know, it's the last grab line, trailing line behind. So we're going, yeehaw, yeehaw. So the wave knock off my friend, boom, he goes, whoom, whoa. <laughs> so he grabbed the line, so he stayed behind his stuff too. And then Dad looked, good, hey. So he turned up, wind. He started screaming them out. So I go, uh oh. So I start climbing up, coming back. What you doing out there? So I start screaming at him too, right? <laughs> and I go, don't tell my dad. <laughs> so anyway, that's my, my funny story. <laughs> Uncle, Uncle John? Yeah, you know, uh, Brian's father, when I got to sail with him on the first trip, 1976, prior to that, we, we used to go sailing off Kualoa. Every weekend, we'd all get together and go sailing. And I remember a couple of times, uh, Buff was steering, and we'd go across all the way to the Marine Corps station, go between the rock, this big rock outside, and then turn around and come back. And there's a sandbar. You know the sandbar that's famous now? Everybody gets stupid on there. Now they, they made it illegal to get stupid over there. So we, we, uh, we're going pretty fast, and we went right over that sandbar, and these People are on a boat, they're all sitting there drinking their cocktails and they watch this huge canoe just go right through the sand, right over dry land, boom. And Buff is just, see, I mean, so calm, you know, we were under control, you know, and we were, myself was, myself and uh, Billy Richards, we go, hey, we just ran, went right over the sand. I said, yeah, there's no water, nothing. He said, yeah, Buff is steering, it's good, it's all good. The other one was, Buffalo, um, when we left, you know, our, our, our voyage didn't take any 15 days. The first voyage was 31 and, a, 31 and a half days to get to land. And so Buff, you know, we're getting ready. We're at Maui. We're, at, we're getting ready for the Ava ceremony. And Mao's imparting this wisdom to us. And he said, yeah, everybody, you know, work, basically work together. And we're going to see that place where you want to go. Um, so prior to that, everybody's eating, you know, you eat a lot, you figure, yeah. And so I was 240, 240, uh, 31 days later, I was 165. I said, <laughs> then I thought to myself, what a great way to lose weight. <laughs> Go on, on this long voyage, you're going to lose weight because you have to burn six to 8,000 calories daily to, to just, and all your muscles that you knew you never used before now, Hey, you got to Tahiti. Uh, one week later, I was back to 220 drinking <laughs> Kinano. You know, I was going, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that another one was Mao would, would every morning he'd get up, Mao would, he'd be up early and he'd be watching the sunrise. And when you, when you look at, when he was looking at the sunrise, as we cross the equator, uh, Brian's dad would go, you know what? In his mind, he said, from Hawaii to Tahiti, that's one big jump in your mind. So put your mind from Hawaii to the top of the equator, wherever that is. Put it in your mind, from the top of the equator to the middle of the equator to the other side of the equator. Take it in sections because he said for him, you know, he says he wasn't one rocket scientist, but he said, I can't do it from Tahiti to Hawaii or, and vice versa back again. So Mao was saying, one day Mao goes, I want to, you know, he, he wants to always fish. There's always a fisherman. And so the most important guys, not the navigator, it's the cook and the fishing guy. <laughs> if you get one good cook and a fisherman, everything will be happy. 
you know, they, you just augmented with the nav. I call them navigators, <laughs> because basically, you know, you're you're trying to uh, you're trying to when you get the idea of a navi navigator captain. Hey, you got all these people on your charge. They're under you, and you got to make sure that you get from this point to where you're going all safe. And, and then you think about the responsibility of going around the world all those years. But in that first trip, Mao, he would get up in the morning and he goes, when you see the bird, there's a, like a, a shear water. Shear water in the back of the canoe. Get ready with the hook. Mao made all these hooks and Rhoda Williams made all these hooks and put them in the water. He said, you see the bird, you can catch the fish because the bird is following the mahi mahi who's following the canoe to see if rubbish is coming off so he can get it. So the bird's telling you, there's a fish over there. Here's Mao, he puts the hook in, he catches the fish. And then we get this uh, mahi mahi on board. And the canoe in those days was, Billy and myself, we would get in the front because all the knives would come out. You, somebody gonna get stabbed, the canoe is rocking, you know. He said, hey, stay away from there. Let Clifford and Dookie them, they're, they're gonna clean the fish. Ma, he cuts, he cuts, a, he cuts between the gills, cut in the back of here, breaks the head off. He zips that thing so fast, and he puts his, uh, he gets all the eggs. Next thing you know, he's putting it in the fire, burn, the, burn this, almost half raw, burnt. That's what he likes. About, you know, like an hour, two hours later, oh, he got gout. You know, that's <laughs> uric. You know, uric. He's just, he's eating that stuff. And then he's telling everybody else, don't eat it. So then <laughs> we, we don't eat this, this uh, the entrails. So then uh, Boogie puts it in a bucket, oh. a white bucket. Hey, that thing gets phosphorus, glow at night. It's like a light. <laughs> so you walk around the bucket. You don't have a flashlight, right? And, and he's he had this small little bucket. And this thing's glowing. He's like, ah, oh, we're. So a lot of this stuff that Mao knew um, and when I got to go to see Mao's Island in Sarawa, when we delivered uh, my Sioux, we built this canoe for Mao. And Mao, uh, what, maybe 100, 100 people on the island. Mm -hmm. And there's four chiefs on the island. And these chiefs, they go in the water. The first thing, they go look at the morning sunrise, and they're, they're there in the evening. And their job is to look what the day is going to bring. And then you see all these canoes go out. And these are the young guys who go fish. And so basically the navigator is idea of being, you're going to feed the island. You're going to go fish, you come back. You got to know how to come back. But their island got so much fish. So Buff and, and Leighton, they go, why, why are they going out? So they went right off the reef, right off of Mao's house. There's this drop of this, the full on ocean, but it's all reef. And it's like a haula, where there's a lot of reef and then it just drops off. We got out there and you're drifting down on a current and you're looking at the mass. All you see is all, what do you want to eat? Lobster, there's a redfish, the uku, all the way down the line like this. And you're just getting all this fish. It's okay, this is what we need. Those guys, they're going to go to, they went to uh, Uliti Island, which is uninhabited, but they came on at night. Timmy, Gilliam, those guys went. And they, uh, they went charge the island to get the turtles. So here, he said, you go up, as soon as you land, the turtles are on the beach. You just grab them, you flip them over. And what we caught, they caught 15 turtles. And they brought the turtles back for the pole ceremony that Nainoa and Bruce and uh, Onohi and Kalepa, they, they got initiated with seven other Micronesians. So, their, their life is, is a different life, but their life is, if you become the, the pole person, not only to know how to catch fish, but to know how to build a canoe, to know how to make the line, to know, uh, um, basically you're like, you know, you're, you're the provider for the island. And I think the hokulea is the same way where it, it gives you the opportunity and the light so you go, I could have, I was thinking to myself, 40 years, I either could have been in the, I could have been in the shed house or I could have been on that canoe. So I figured, hey, you know, I got out of the service. My mom says, 
about a month at home, she goes, hey, you, gotta, you better go talk to somebody. So I went to Tripler. I stayed there two weeks. And that was just when they were starting to learn all this stuff, PTSD. And then when I get on the canoe, I meet Billy Richard Snake. They all went to Vietnam the same time. We didn't even know each other. And they, you know, they're going, hey, you know, this canoe is, is the grounding. This canoe is the one that saved us. You know, I, I could have gone the other way, who knows? But it, it's crazy how life deals you the hand, and that's, that's what you got to play with. But yeah, it's um, again, I'm honored to be here talking to you guys. Mahalo. <laughs> and it and it may be in a in one or two generations that it's this canoe that actually helps save planet Earth through its journey and through its introduction of Kuleana and the desire to actually fix things. So, sorry for the two younger guys, we ran out of time. Um, I'm gonna honor the, the place, uh, the time, and it's seven, it's a little after actually 7.40. So, on the agenda it says that's a time for questions from the audience. So, hang on guys, I don't know what they're gonna ask. <coughs> yes, I'll repeat the question, go ahead. Did anybody on any of the lakes experience any interactions with pirates? We had, um, so the, the route that, so I kind of took the canoe to Mauritius and then I was part of the crew that took the canoe from Mauritius to Cape Town. Uh, so if you imagine the world map, right? Mauritius is one tiny little island off of uh, the east side of Madagascar and Madagascar is east of mainland Africa. So this tiny little island, just like Maui, is actually the same latitude, exactly like Maui. Um, we, we decided to go south because on the northern side, supposedly had all kind of activity with, with pirate uh, action because uh, that's near Somalia. Everybody's seen that Captain Phillips movie. Yeah? And so uh, that movie you know, shed the light of what the bigger countries was doing to this tiny little country. And so, I don't feel bad for those guys that got robbed because they, the bigger countries when go robbed, that was the main pirating right there. You know, they was, they was robbing Somalia of their fishing resource because that's all they did was fish. And so that's why the, all this news about them being pirates and taking the tankers, I mean, they kind of went overboard with that stuff, but I mean, you know, that's all they had was their fish, you know what I mean? So once your, your resource is depleted, of course you can go uh, react uh, and, and go take whatever the, their resource they get. For, for them was oil. And so, um, but they was looking at the, as the bad guys. So anyway, Nainoa decided to go south. Uh, we went south when we when we hit uh, was uh, Richards Bay was our first uh, landing, uh, uh, planned landing, because we stopped in Mozambique for a little bit. We got cracks over there and then went down to Richards Bay. But we talked to the locals and uh, that whole time when you know it was all clear. Never have no. Uh, ocean pirating action going on but at Richards Bay the all the the sailors there they asked what route we went because they saw the vessel at first they're like you guys came on that raft like <laughs> like that was a normal thing everybody's like that that raft <laughs> and so you know got to educate them try to be like not violent about it <laughs> but um uh we told them oh we went south and they're like what the hell like that's crazy like why you guys did that and they all get pirates, and they all laugh. They go, oh, pirates, that was back in, like, 2011. You guys watch too much movie, you Americans. I was like, oh, Baba, easy, but not American, but easy. Easy, easy. But, uh, but yeah, we did have land, land pirates, though. I don't think anybody will share this story yet on video or books or whatever, but I don't care. I see them. Uh, we had a land crew that, that was taking a lot of our excess gear that we was trying to light in the canoe. So we had about four people, I think, in, the, in this van traveling on the land, following the canoe. And, and South Africa is, is pretty gangster. Like, they, they're crazy over there. Like, all, everybody carried AK-47s, and, like, that's a real deal. Like, the, the cops there is nuts. And so had on, had on one speed trap. Uh, one roadblock and and then they didn't stop was Uncle Billy, Kaimana, uh, uh, Carsey and um, our doctor Carolyn uh, Irondale, I think her her last name. But they got stopped and we, the van was filled with all kind of goodies right from the canoe. 
and um, expensive stuff. And <laughs> the cops told him, oh, um, you, you guys are speeding. And, and Kaimano was the driver. And he's like, no way, I never speed. And then the guy go, oh, I'll, we're going to give you a ticket for um, 2,500 Rand, which was like, I don't know, $180 or something, uh, US. And so uh, they go, what? No way, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but then look back, the whole thing was filled, right? So they never like get taxed with all of our stuff. So they say, ah, whatever, um, give them the money. And because the guy go, oh, you're either going to pay this or you can go caught. So you know what? Uh, we'll, we'll charge you like 1,800 Rand. And so they got jacked, you know what I mean? Like, like straight crooked cop kind of action, so not to put them on blast, but what happened, you know what I mean? Uh, anyway, that was the pirating action that happened during that time of Africa. Never were you expected, right? Never, ever, yeah. Another question? Yes. <laughs> she was waiting. <laughs> um, I think throughout the years we had many funny, great moments, um, and uh, I think it's because of the guys that showed before us. Uh, before we went to Japan, uh, Uncle John started a rumor <laughs> of um, when we get to Japan, all the sumo wrestlers from Hawaii going to come onto the canoe. <laughs> but 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 we got to all stand on one side of the canoe. <laughs> Because if they step on board, the canoe will flip over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of our crew members, uh, Kanako, Kana, Kana. that was from Okinawa, she seriously thought it was a, a real <laughs> story. And she started telling everybody, telling news people. Uh, <laughs> everywhere she went, she was so happy to see the Hawaiian um, sumo wrestlers were going to come on board Hokulea. <laughs> And then we're standing on the dock in Kauai High, uh, getting ready for start the voyage. Um, Uncle John never <laughs> know Kano was standing behind him. And he leans over to Auntie and he's like, hey, I started this rumor about the, the sumo wrestlers <laughs> coming on board. <laughs> she hits him right on the back. Yeah. Ah, Uncle John, I've been telling everybody. <laughs> I've been telling the news and everything. Um, they, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they did come though what right? with Mel <laughs> well no he said one day Mel and Dennis they were sitting on the dock at waiting for the tour to start and these you know, Japanese they're obedient right they all line up and he's looking at all this and he said if Mercedes pulls up these two big guys in, in suits yeah they go wow this must be the no it was the princess it was um, Akahito's uh, daughter and she just finished uh, school at Yale, so perfect English. She wanted to get on the canoe. And so these guys, they, they're the bodyguards. And they're like, Whoa. But you know, all those years um, we, um, we have done this, um, there are so many um, stories that inspire you, but also there's a lot of stupid stories. <laughs> so, I, mean, just, I mean, you would think that people would would, um, like we're in New Zealand one day and we're doing a haul out and we have the two uh, Maori w uh, girls with us, uh, Hoki and uh, Big Emma. And we'd, we'd, Kelo is driving the uh, Hotu's van and he's going on a southern motorway, he's going fast. And she's, she's telling, uh, Ho Hoki is going, oh, uh, Mr. Kia, um, you know, you're driving pretty fast. He goes, yeah, so I gotta get to Hobson where the canoe was in the haul out. And she goes, uh, you know, but every roundabout, they got the camera, take a picture, you speeding, they send you to, they get it home. So, okay, Lord, not in my car, he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> we get back to Hawaii, Hotu gets all these tickets. <laughs> he put them in an envelope and sent them back to Nainoa. And Nainoa goes, what the hell are you? Oh, uh, yeah, I was speeding. I was trying to get to work. <laughs> and then, you know, when you go around the roundabout, there, there's a lot of roundabouts. And she goes, you got to watch out. You got to go slow because you got to hit. Oh, we hit, we hit the, the speed trap, right? She goes, oh, you got to watch out for those quickies. And we're going, quickies? That's what they call them in New Zealand. So Keloa goes, quickies, where I come from, is like totally different. <laughs> she goes, oh. I mean, it's just so many kind of stories like that, you know? 
So, uh, and they helped us work on that canoe. And, you know, the other one was we would, we would work, uh, hey, we work long, 14-hour uh, days until dark. You can't see anymore. And then get, put all your stuff back in the van and drive an hour to get back to Hotu's house. And did that for two weeks. And then same thing with South Africa. We stayed three weeks there and we, and we worked, you know. And, you know, the, the idea that um, the canoe, um, I think all canoes, you know, because people ask us uh, why you sail that thing, you know. And you get all the people come from all over and then you also get the, uh, what I call the lunatic fringe. We're in Tahiti. We pull into Tahiti and this guy's yelling to us on the pier, you know. He said, yeah, yeah, hokulea. You know, he's, he's uh, effing hokulea. And Tava, Tava's looking at that guy. And he goes, you know, he, so he asked us if we had brought uh, pakalolo. Do we have pakalolo? Pui paka. <laughs> and we looked at him and Tava is like a, to me, Tava is like a little bulldog on a short leash. <laughs> and Nainoa, he's Nainoa's bodyguard, right? So we go to Moria and that same guy is over there. And this guy is mouthing off. So then we, we, we stayed in Moria and then we sailed back to Papieti. And where we parked in Papieti on the, on the quay, there's all these uh, lunch, lunch wagons. Guys mouthing off, same guy. And then we were thinking to ourselves, hey, Tava. Tava said, nah, I'm not gonna do nothing because they found out after that Tava used to be, the, when he was younger, the South Pacific middleweight boxing champion. And you know, when you walk in the streets, in the back streets of Papiete, they know who that guy is. Oh, they're coming up autographed. They, hey, Tava, I said, hey, the Huru, you know. And, and the thing is, Hokulea attracts all these kind of people, all good people and all uh, lunatic fringe people. <laughs> <laughs> You're not just talking about the crew, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mostly the crew. Yeah. <laughs> I think for, for a funny story, I mean, we cannot tell a funny story on Hokulea without talking about our, our great friend, uh, Timmy Gilliam. <laughs> Um, I think each one of our crew members, we, we have funny stories uh, with Timmy. Um, yeah, which one do I tell? Um, yeah, so one night, me and Timmy was cruising outside. Um, well, we was walking around in Okinawa. Uh, it was golden week, so, you know, they said, you know, you can walk around with, with, with beers in your hand and nobody's going to bother you. So, oh, shoot, walking around. We can walk into a store with, with two cans in your hand. It's all good. Walk out with two cases in your hand. <laughs> and it's just all good. Um, and we was, uh, you can buy bottle rockets every day. And over here, you know, we cannot buy bottle rockets. So we buy this whole pack of bottle rockets, go outside the store, sitting on the curb. And we're looking up. It's like, hey, I know it's in uh, the, the fourth floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we start shooting rockets up towards his room, up towards his room window. Um, and then he comes down. He's like, "Hey, what the hell's going on?" He's like, "Hey, it's Golden Week, <laughs> you know." <laughs> um, yeah, but my friend Timmy, you know, he was. I don't know if you just never know how bottle rockets work, but um, <laughs> he thought. Guess we just had too much to drink, but um, so you, f you hold the stick, yeah. you light it, and it will shoot off the stick, and you just hold the stick. <laughs> so he must have burned his hands about four times <laughs> be before he figured out you gotta let the stick go. <laughs> you gotta let the rocket go. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stories, so much funny stories that, that we can tell about each other and, and whatnot, things that we did on board. Um, you know, from, from crossings, channel crossings, or equator crossings. As a rookie, you gotta do something. Um, a skit or, or something. Um, so we have a lot of those, um, those moments that, you know, I never make them onto cameras. <laughs> uh, where we all have to dress up and act and do all kinds of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the only clean <laughs> Stories. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of want rascal bug. It's not my fault. These guys fault. 
<laughs> you know, we go out, we party, and uh, we have a good time with the people we with, enjoy the company of others, and we never know where it's going to end up. We Me and, yeah, we learn from the best. <laughs> uh, many a times, you know, walking back to the canoe the next morning, and Cap is looking at you like, bro, where the hell you guys went last night? <laughs> like, bro, we didn't mean to. But um, we met some great people and, you know, had a good time. Um, and just on FYI, as hot as we party, we always made crew call all the time, on time. Yeah. And took the canoe safely to whatever we're going to go. So all you guys watching, young guys watching on the video, party hard, but go work the next That's day. That's the message, right? That is the message. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, you're not going to ever get invited again, for like straight up. Like Kalepa, one time we stay in New York, he, he's like, me and uh, our good friend, Waimeama King, uh, the one port we pulled in uh, on the stop on the way up to Ganawage on the river in uh, New York, um, the guy was like tripping out. He's like, "Oh, canoe!" And then he heard about the story and opened his bar for us. You know, he's like, "Oh, okay, right on." <laughs> we drank everything, <laughs> but and Kalep was like, "Bro, you guys better wake up tomorrow." But we never go sleep. That was the st smart, you know, the strategy was just don't go sleep, just go work right after. Like, okay, cool, and it was all good, but. But yeah, like I, <laughs> I was thinking of Timmy too. The f we stayed, <laughs> we was, um, so you know we we was in Mauritius, and uh, we got we were sponsored by Outrigger uh, Resorts for this voyage. And so, oh, it was such a hard life on Mauritius and Outrigger for two weeks. <laughs> Went to the rum country. <laughs> <laughs> open yeah. open bar and f they feed us three meals a day, and everybody get their own hotel room. Oh, it was so rough. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know it was kind of making us soft because you know the anticipation for this this leg was like the most dangerous leg and the, the scariest and the pirates and the, the big wet the weather the storms and all this kind of stuff you know the other side of the world southern hemisphere the list was was great bigger animals in the water you know all that kind of stuff and so uh two weeks being there but pampered was this was ridiculous like and and thank goodness I had great crew for this, <laughs> keep the, the party going, I guess, in a way, and lively. Uh, but when we, when we finally uh, set sail, um, we got uh, one of our, our, our drivers, his name was Kumar, uh, this, this Indian guy. Mauritius is loaded with, like, you know, like that kind of Indian guys. And, um, but they speak French, yeah, like, that, that, it was unreal, like, it was, it was unreal. It's just, un, you know, perspective, we'll see. But, uh, this guy we was asking uh, him for see if we get bamboo for our outriggers, and so um, he go, oh yes, yes, Sams, we, we must go uh, to my house. And then as you can see, a lot of the stories is off the canoe, yeah, but it's <laughs> it's just connected to it. But um, so we go to his house, we harvest this ohe and and uh, make our outriggers, and then it, the thing was long, it was like a thirty foot uh, piece, cut them up. And then, uh, so we make our outriggers, we label them Kumar, Mauritius, all that stuff. And then Timmy, like the whole time he was making this like stick. And I was like, what, bro, what are you making? And finally he's like, bro, film me, film me. Send this to Naalehu, who's the owner of OEV TV. Send this to Naalehu, bro, like get hired. And I was like, what? <laughs> so he, he had this, like he was so proud of his little GoPro that he had. He hook him up and had this like eight foot GoPro pole. Stick the stick <laughs> going around filming everything like he was I was like bro get out the shot like <laughs> but um anyway we're fishing one day uh on the way to Mozambique and he uh we get we get double strike and uh the one one of the the, the starboard side hull it hit and then the, the port side hit uh and Timmy is our fisherman and uh, and meanwhile he just went down in the hall for go take shower <laughs> and so because I'm the documenter, I always instantly, as soon as the, the rubber band pop, I grab my camera for film him because sometimes life on the canoe is a little bit boring. And so that's like the only action get. So bro, man, as soon as that side on pop, the port side on pop, he's screaming. He's like, you better not grab the camera. Because <laughs> body is naked, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, live action, bro. Get out the way. Look at the fish. <laughs> The curtain open, he's over there, bro, hold on. <laughs> oh, man. But, um, and he would land the fish, by the way. He, you know, halfway naked, he finally pulled his pants up. Got the, the it was a little shibi, like 40 pounds. Bring him on board. It was an awesome dinner. But, uh, 
I mean, that was that was just one tiny one, like a, the safe one of, of all the funny <laughs> stories that uh, that happened on and off the canoe. So. Yeah, you know the the, the guys on Oivi Naalehu them, they film uh, every every voyage, every part of the voyage. So it takes them at least ten hours to upload all that to the satellite to get back to Hawaii from wherever they are, and so. Aina was in on, our, on on the second leg. I was the leg from Tahiti to the Cooks to Samoa to Tonga, and so Aina was was the videographer. And as you know, that when he's doing his uh, downloading all the stuff, he's got this big shroud. He opens up the cover and shroud. He's in there like in a big box of the old style camera. I said, "Oh, Aina." I'm gonna plug in my, everybody got cell phone right now. 40 something years ago, everybody's going, what, the cell phone? We had eight track tape. <laughs> you know, so everybody, hey, plug in my phone. So every place we'd go, I'd make sure my phone was plugged in. So when we'd, we'd get to the next place, early in the morning, wake up, it was four o'clock in the morning. I get my phone out and I play, um, Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles. So then Aina went and made this whole video of all these canoes going, and the, one of the, the songs was, and then we made a video, um, uh, music video, the music video, and we didn't know if it was kosher with Nainoa them <laughs> to go play it, right? And to me, I thought it was pretty cool because uh, the Hikiana Leo is off in the, in the distance, and we, before we even hit this big storm, before we hit Rarotonga, we had this music video, everybody was, uh, um, you know that song, uh, Fantastic Voice, come along with, so everybody was doing this thing, and the only guy was, uh, I call him Mr. Happy, Kala Thomas, he's always serious, he's steering, he's not even smiling, not, everybody just having good time, right, and he's shooting this video. So then Kalepa on Hikiana Leah sees it, and they, hey, how do you guys have time to do that? Because right after that, we got hit by this huge storm, and for, we, we got, the storm hit at nine o'clock in the morning, didn't abate till the next day, one, two o'clock. The sun comes up on that day. It's all, hey, sun, wow. And then all of a sudden you hear the, the radio crackles and Onohi Paishan is the captain. And on that is Tua Pittman, the other crew member from Rarotonga, from the, we call them the cookies, right? He's going, hey, Onohi, this is Tua. You're gonna come to Rarotonga. You gotta come to my island. So he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, where are you guys gonna pull up in Avitu? Got the best hamburgers on all of the Cook Islands. As soon as he said hamburgers, everybody look at each other. We put up all the sails, there was no wind. <laughs> we put up a, two jibs in the front. Then it started shaking the boom back and forth <laughs> to try and make wind, you know. We got there in two days. <laughs> Took us two days, no wind. And so Henry Puna, the premier of the Cook Islands, he goes, uh, Hokulea, Fafayete, and Hikianalia, you guys are two days late. We, we ate all the kai. Had a, all these elders, right? The, it's raining, raining, and they're all underneath the tarp, and they're all looking stern, right? And they said, hey, we, we ate all the food. And everybody's going, well, you know, we, we got stuck in the storm, and we had all this emergency. So he said, at the end, he goes, ah, never mind. I kept the brew. Brings these two big coolers out, all uh, what is that? Um, was uh, our um, DB bitters and Steinlager. So everybody's going, oh, okay. So then the, looking for that hamburger place. You can buy these hamburgers that big, five bucks. And you know, the Cook Islands hamburger, uh, like a sesame seed bun. When he said that, all the, the best hamburgers are all the uh, Cook Islands, everybody's going, huh? And you know, the storm had just whacked us out. Dropped the sail, um, was so cold and, and full on rain coming sidewards. Told everybody, open up the, you know, the, the sail bag loft. Get the sail bag, put them on, sit on the deck, put your fall weather on, and just put the, your safety harness on. Everybody up on the deck, riding this thing out, bare pole, only the jib up, and just pound it. We didn't know that the Hikiana Lea and the Tahitian canoe, Fafaete, was, the captain was, uh, uh, Fatirao, and she was a young girl, captain. And she goes, we saw it when we got to the cooks. I said, oh, you didn't hit the storm? She goes, no, uncle. 
We went up north. I didn't want to get my panties wet. <laughs> we should have gone up north, you know. But uh, so you know, you hear this guy and you go, oh. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, you just brought a sense of pride to all the wahine in the room. Yeah. <laughs> so I know, I know this could go on forever and ever because this is just the feeling that comes through you comes from the canoe and the connection with the audience and the connection with the moku. I mean, you can feel it, yeah. But to honor the time that uh, we set forth, um, we're going to cut the questions um, short tonight. Um, there will be another um, gathering of the, cr of the crew uh, on the 19th. I think it's uh, over at the Wainai District Park. 5.30, same time. So hold your questions, and uh, we'll try to answer them then. Thank you. So a big hand for the, the crew members that came and made you laugh. And how about a big hand for Uncle William Isla for facilitating tonight's discussion.